Well, when I preached a few weeks ago, uh, we saw Jesus questioned and beaten by the Sanhedrin, the, the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem. And the reason for that was that he was claiming to be the Christ, the Son of God. They asked him directly, and he responded emphatically, I am. In this week's passage, Jesus will once again be beaten uh, after being questioned by Pilate, as we saw last week, this time by Roman soldiers for claiming to be the king of the Jews. As Jesus nears the end of his life, everything about his identity is being called into question, both his divine nature as God and his royal status as king of the Jews. This is a stark example of what happens when people in power use their power to harm and shame those who are not in power. So this is not something that's new. This has been going on for All of human history, those who are powerful, treating those who are not powerful in this way, abusing their power. But this has certainly become something of a focal point in our culture today with the rampant bullying that we are hearing more and more of, particularly in schools or on the internet. So much so that the Center for Disease Control and the Department of Education have come together recently to create a definition for bullying. They define it as harming and humiliating others, specifically those who are in some way smaller, weaker, younger, or in any way more vulnerable than the bully. This includes unwanted aggressive behavior, observed or perceived power imbalance, and repetition of behaviors, or a high likelihood of repetition. Now, this can be in a couple of different forms. This can occur directly or indirectly. For most of Jesus' ministry, he had been bullied indirectly. The things that the people in power were saying about him, the ways that they were questioning him and trying to undermine him. But at the end of his life, this is a very direct attack on Jesus and his identity. Bullying can come in all kinds of different forms, but primarily comes in the form of, of verbal abuse or bullying. There can also be relational damage or physical harm as Jesus is experiencing or uh, damage to property. But the most common, as I said, is a verbal attack, saying something derogatory about someone. And this often happens, as we know, in a group setting. There's kind of a mob mentality. Those who are in power are in power because they have many people around them. They have a high social standing. They're popular or they are influential. And so they gather together others like them to attack those who are outside their group, those who are different, those who are vulnerable. There's all kinds of questions around what motivates someone to treat others in this way. What motivates someone to bully another person, to treat them in this, in this way? Well, a big part of that is the way that it, it tends to wrongly increase their social standing. There's something about tearing down another person that seemingly builds another up. It's this false sense of security and strength and power that the person is experiencing. They feel that they have to make someone feel less than them in order to feel more. And this is a very prominent and prevalent experience. Most of us, in some form or fashion, have experienced bullying firsthand. Research says that somewhere between 25 to 35 percent of all students in the U.S. have experienced bullying at some time. So to imagine that as we send our kids to school tomorrow, that one-fourth of those students will experience bullying in some form or fashion. The risk that it is to go into a social setting where that could be the case. But with verbal bullying being the main emphasis, we might question, what is the, what's the harm? What's the effect that this has on someone who experiences this kind of treatment? They're not being, most often, not being hurt physically. Well, the reality is that bullying in any form has a greater impact on our sense of who we are, our identity. Brene Brown, who is a self-professed shame researcher, she's dedicated her, her life's work to understanding shame and its effects and what causes it, says that, that shame is the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. This is the result 
of bullying. This belief is formed in us that we are less than, that we are flawed, and that our flaws, our differences, mean that we are unworthy of love or belonging, that we are on the outside looking in. And if you've ever experienced something like that, you know how intensely painful that is to be an outsider, to be ridiculed for your differences. So Brene Brown has spent her, her life's work trying to consider what does it look like to, be, to build resilience against shame? How do we endure this kind of treatment? How do we fight against this false belief that we are unworthy of love and belonging? That those in power don't get to determine who we are. And she describes it in this way. That there's uh, several guideposts that she identifies that help us point us toward shame resilience. As you listen to these, consider how Jesus embodies these completely and fully. She says that shame resilience includes cultivating authenticity and letting go of what people think. It includes cultivating resilience and hope and letting go of numbing. Cultivating gratitude and joy, letting go of scarcity and the fear of the dark. Cultivating intuition and faith, letting go of certainty. Cultivating creativity, letting go of comparison and conformity and competition. Cultivating play and rest, letting go of exhaustion and productivity as status and self-worth. Cultivating calm and stillness, letting go of anxiety. Cultivating meaningful work, letting go of self-doubt and supposed to. And finally, cultivating laughter, song, and dance, letting go of being cool and always in control. So that's the question for today is, how did Jesus remain silent in the midst of this horrific treatment? How did he endure the treatment that he experienced? How did he keep it from shaping his belief in who he is? So we're going to see the treatment of Jesus and consider what's motivating those who are treating this, him in this way, as well as how he was able to persevere through such harsh treatment. We'll look first at the, the soldiers who are responsible for treating Jesus in this way. We read in verse 16, And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole battalion, and they clothed him in a purple cloak, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him, and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. And they led him out to crucify him. What first struck me in reading this passage this week was that the whole battalion was called in this moment. A battalion at this time would have been roughly 600 men. So 600 men are called to lead Jesus to his death. Why on earth was that necessary for one man? I've never pictured this scene in that way until now. I've always thought just, you know, a handful of guards kind of led him away. But the whole battalion was called. What Pilate is doing here is a couple of things. But first and foremost, he is showing the force that is available at his disposal, the power that he has. But he's doing so out of fear. Fear that Jesus was really dangerous or fear that the Jews would actually rebel, either on Jesus' behalf or just in general. And so what he's trying to do is show them who's in charge, who's in power, that he at a moment's notice can call 600 men to come to his side, to come to his aid. You see, bullies are often deeply insecure people. They, have this, they wear this mask of strength and power, which they display to others, but if you can see beyond that, it's just posturing. Really, in almost every bully, there is insecurity, there are fears, there is weakness. And so they compensate and they overcompensate for those insecurities. And Pilate is no different. Pilate is insecure. He's afraid of what will happen if he allows these rebels 
to over, overcome him. He's afraid of losing his position of power, which he later on does, in fact, lose his power. So he's attempting to show his strength in order to maintain his power. He's operating out of fear, not wisdom. And what often happens is when a bully does something like this, others get swept up in the action. I don't know what it would have been like for all 600 of those men to see this treatment of Jesus. I would imagine that of those 600, there at least would have been some who would have seen this and said, this is not right. This should not happen. But this mob mentality overcomes us, and we want to be in the, in, uh, on the right side of the situation. We want to show our allegiance to those who are in power. So I'd imagine many of these soldiers are doing what they're doing because they want to show Pilate and the other soldiers, their peers, that they're on their side, that they're not taking this, this Jew seriously. Stanley Milgram famously uh, did some ex experiments back in the 60s and 70s where he was trying to understand why people do what they do. Why would people do something that's in opposition to their conscience when they're told by authority figures to do so? Some of it was trying to understand why the many soldiers in Hitler's army would do what they did. Why did they follow these orders? And so he set up this, this experiment where there was a person kind of uh, off to the side that you couldn't see, and then there was a, a kind of an instructor, a researcher, and then the, the subject was actually the person who was administering these shocks to this learner. And so the researcher would say, you know, the person got the question wrong, administer this shock to the person they couldn't see. What they could hear was the person crying out in pain every time they would shock them. And they would continue to increase the voltage, or at least pretend to increase the voltage, every time the person got a question wrong. What they were really testing is, how far would this person go in shocking this, this perfect stranger when being told to do so by the person in authority? What they found is that some people even were willing to administer shock values that would have possibly killed someone because they wanted to obey the person in authority. When asked later why they did that, they would simply say, because I was told to. Because this person told me to, and I didn't want to do the wrong thing. I didn't want to essentially disobey the person in power. It was interesting that these experiments showed that a very high proportion of people were willing to fully obey the instructions, even though they expressed their reluctance. Many times they would plead to stop, and yet they would continue when told to continue. They were told, this is what you signed up for, this is what you agreed to. And that sense of responsibility and obedience overrode their, their conscience to stop the experiment. So I imagine there's something of that going on here with this, these 600 men in Pontius Pilate's battalion. Many of them probably saw this treatment and thought, this is too much, this is unnecessary for this one man. Why? Are they treating him this way? But as far as we can tell, none of them spoke up. Many of them participated. Many of them, you can kind of see this kind of escalation, kind of outdoing one another in humiliating Jesus. So they beat him and they mock him. They beat him to the point where he's beyond human recognition. He's dehumanized. He's less than human. We wouldn't recognize him. This is what Isaiah 52 says, that his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. We would have looked at him and we wouldn't have recognized him as a man, let alone a man that we would know. His face would be so disfigured that he would be unrecognizable. This is the severity of the treatment that he receives. They treat him as less than human. But they not only beat him physically, they attack his very identity of who he is. Everything they do is orchestrated to prove to him, to show to him that he's not really the king of the Jews, that he's not really a king. So someone goes and gets a, a purple cloak, 
So again, look at the, the creativity and the intentionality behind this. This isn't something they would have just had on hand. Someone went and got this prop and put it on Jesus simply to mock him. Someone took the time to weave together a crown of thorns. They had to go and gather the thorns. They had to weave it together into a crown and to place it on his head, both to cause pain but also more humiliation. They were striking him, spitting on him, taunting him. And then they began to salute him and kneel at his feet, this kind of false homage to him. Oh, you want to be king, do you? Treating him in mockery. What they were trying to show him is, you don't get to decide who's king. Caesar is king. You're no king. And wanting to show the others who would have been watching this or hearing of this experience, don't mess with Rome. Don't mess with Caesar. This is what happens when you step out of line. Last time I, I preached, there was, um, I, I alluded to a, a scene in the, the Narnia books, uh, The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, and, the, and particularly in the scene in the film version of that, where uh, there's an interaction between the witch and Aslan. And shortly after that, after Aslan has agreed to uh, stand in place of Edmund and, and essentially give his life for Edmund's sake, there's this, another great scene in that film where uh, Aslan is led away. And so what we see happening in that section is, you know, we have this picture of Aslan, this great lion, this, this full mane, this majestic figure of nobility and royalty and power. I alluded to his kind of huge roar that caused the witch to tremble in her shoes. But he's agreed to lay down his life for Edmund's sake to save him. And he's led away, and we see this, this mob gather around him, and they shave off his mane. They shave off this symbol of power and prominence. And then they bind him to the stone table. So we see this picture on the right of what happens after he is treated this way. What they're trying to do to Aslan is what these soldiers are doing to Jesus, to say, you're not really the king. You're not really so powerful, so strong, so brave. You're nothing. They're trying to, to strip Jesus of everything about his identity, everything about who he is. In exchange, they are mocking him and treating him in this way. So how is it that Jesus endures this kind of treatment? How is it that Aslan would suffer in this way? Well, Hebrews gives us an insight into this. In Hebrews 12, verses two, verse 2, it says, For the joy that was set before him, Jesus endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. For the joy that was set before him. What Jesus was able to do, which many of us struggle and fail to do, is see beyond his suffering, to see through this horrific treatment to the other side. He knew that on the other side of the cross was joy. In that moment, it would have been painful and difficult, maybe nearly impossible to keep focused on that, to experience this kind of suffering, but to keep focused on what is on the other side. See, often in the midst of our suffering, we want God to remove the suffering or we want uh, him to help us circumvent the suffering. But what God often does is helps us to endure the suffering, to go through it to the other side where there is joy, where we are honored by God, where he says, well done, you've been faithful in the midst of your suffering. And Jesus knew that's what awaited him on the other side of this horrific treatment, this shameful treatment of the rightful king. On the other side was the throne of God that he would be welcomed into and given a seat at the Father's right hand. Now there's also this phrase in that, in that verse that Jesus despised the shame. What that signifies is that he saw it in right proportion. It was it was insignificant in comparison to the joy that he was to experience. It was kind of like a, 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 bu a, a bug buzzing in his ear or a gnat flying in his face. He just kind of swatted it away. It had no significance 
in comparison to the joy set before him. Now, this is to not, not to suggest that he didn't actually suffer and that this wasn't actually a difficult experience for him, but that he chose to see the shame in light of it really, what it really was. It paled in comparison to what Jesus experienced. I think we understand that as Seattleites on a day like today. We have endured the long winter months of darkness and rain for a day just like this. Amen. Amen. <laughs> we endure that, the dreariness, the, the darkness, because we know that on the other side of that, there will come a day eventually, sometimes March, sometimes April, sometimes a sneak pre preview in February, but there will come a day where the clouds will part and the sun will shine and we will feel its warmth and we will rejoice and we will, we will go outside out of our, our uh, hibernation. So we're able to endure. It's the, it's the little secret about Seattle that people who don't live here don't understand. They think that it rains here all the time, and we want them to believe that. <laughs> Stay away. It's crowded enough as it is. But when people come here, then they realize, hey, wait a second. It's actually really nice here. There's actually a, a significant portion of the year that is incomparable to other places. I remember when friends of mine would visit from the Midwest during the summertime, they're like, you can actually go outside and enjoy the summer. It's not hot and sticky and miserable even in the summer. It's actually nice here. And so that's what allows us to endure. Now, granted, up to this point, we, we start to get a little stir crazy and we start to forget. What was it like again when the sun came out? I think one of the first years that we lived here, we went like 60 days in a row without seeing the sun. Like, what is happening? But now we're accustomed to that. We understand, yes, it's, it's, it's sometimes hard in the midst of it, but there will come a time where the sun will shine again where there will be joy and rejoicing. And that's what it's like for Jesus. He knows that it's often darkest before the dawn. He knows that this is the, the, the low point of his life on earth, but that this is just a moment until he will see the joy set before him. Well, there, there are others as well swept up into this action of Jesus's being, Jesus being led to his death. We read in verse 21, And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. So it's interesting, that I've always found this, this moment interesting, of, of all people walking by, this one individual is chosen to carry Jesus' cross, to get a, a, a front row seat at what Jesus is experiencing. And the reason that, that Jesus was, uh, that this, this man was chosen to, to carry Jesus' cross is that Jesus was likely already at this point completely exhausted, barely able to walk on his own feet. He experienced two beatings uh, and he, almost a kind of near-death beating so that he would have already been, been bloodied and bruised and just exhausted. Remember, this is in the middle of the night, so it's just kind of coming into the next day. So he's been basically awake for a long time. He's been beaten twice. And so normally they would have the... the the criminal carry the cross beam of, of the cross up the hill before being crucified, but Jesus can't even carry it. And so they pull this, this man out of the crowd and, and, call, and tell him to carry it for him. Now normally we have this picture, of, you know, especially someone who's being wrongly accused and being led to their death, uh, this kind of, or even someone who's been conquered in battle, that they want to die well. They want to die with dignity. They want to hold their head up high. They want to display strength and vigor. But that is not the picture of Jesus here. He can't hold his head up high. He doesn't have any strength. He could barely walk. And so it only emphasizes for the Jewish leaders, once again, this cannot possibly be our king. This is not how a king dies. A king die, if a king's going to die, they're going to die in strength, not as a criminal, not in weakness. So they can't understand if this, this guy cannot truly be the king. This is not how kings die. See, all of his life, they wanted to thrust Jesus into the role of king, but he never quite fit into the mold and, 
a picture of what they had in mind for a king. And now even in his death, he doesn't align with their expectations. So Simon is swept up in this action, and he gets to participate in this, and he gets to carry, his, carry Jesus' cross for him. I don't know if once he got to the top of the hill, if he stayed for the rest of the, of the crucifixion. I don't know. We don't really know what happened next for him. There's, there's stories and traditions of what happened. But the fact that he, he's mentioned specifically, that not just any Simon, but Simon of Cyrene, and that his two sons are mentioned, Alexander and Rufus, was not only, did not only become part of church tradition of who these men would become later in life, but it was to say that this was a, a historical event. This really did happen. This is the equivalent of, of modern day citing our sources. Do you want to know what happened? Go talk to these guys. At the writing of Mark's gospel, they would have probably still been alive, at least one of them. They could have gone to them and said, what was that like? If Simon was alive, they could have said, what was that like to be there when this happened? If he wasn't alive, they could go to his sons and say, what did your dad tell you about what that was like? What stories did he share with you? So these are actual historical events. They really did happen, and you could cross-check them by going to these people and asking them these questions. What was that like? What happened? What did you see? It's possible that Mark even talked to them directly and interviewed them for his gospel. These things actually did happen, and these people were actually involved in that occurrence. Well, what they're doing is they're, they're leading Jesus to this place called Golgotha. We read in, in verse 22. They brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. Now, the significance of this is that they're leading him outside of the city proper. This is you know, no longer inside Jerusalem's city limits. It's outside the city, outside the gates, most likely, up onto this hill. And this was true, I thought this was something only reserved for, for Jewish culture, but apparently this was true of Roman culture as well, that they, they would take, they would take uh, people outside of the city for execution. The Jews had all kinds of ceremonial and, and cleansing laws about where they could and couldn't do things, so they would, they would, they would have a kind of a trash heap outside of the city. They would, uh, they would take the remains of sacrifices outside of the city, they would put people who were diseased, you know, people who were leprous, that would be put outside of the camp or outside of the city. The point here is that things that are defiled, things that are rejected, things that are associated with death are not allowed to remain inside the camp or inside the city. They're taken outside. So yet again, this is symbolic of what they're trying to say to Jesus. They are rejecting him. They are exile him, exiling him. They're taking him to the margins of their civilization. They're telling him, you don't belong here. You're not one of us. You belong with diseased and dead things. There's this story in Numbers chapter 12 where Moses is leading the Israelites to the promised land. They're in the midst of the wilderness, and his, uh, his uh, brother and sister, Aaron and Miriam, uh, kind of rise up against him. They're not pleased with his leadership. And so they go and they, they're kind of stirring up opposition to him. They're speaking against him. And God hears this and God confronts Aaron and Miriam. And that doesn't go well for them. And it's, it's, it, it's uh, found out that Miriam was kind of the one who had instigated these things. She was jealous of Moses' position of power and prominence. So God punishes Miriam. He causes her skin to become leprous. And Moses intercedes, as he does so often in his life for his people. He intercedes and pleads with God to have mercy on Miriam. And so God does. He relents. But Miriam still has to go outside of the camp for seven days. And they, so they wait for seven days before continuing on in their journey. And so it's just a, an example of what it would be like to become diseased and to be punished in some way that you were put outside of the camp. Now, because of Moses' intercession, Miriam was welcomed back into the camp. She was allowed to return. And it's Jesus' resurrection that will allow him to return to his people, to be restored in this way. But in this moment, he's being led away from the people, away from 
the people of God. Now, in this moment, they offer him uh, wine mixed with myrrh, and, which is interesting because actually in all this harsh, horrible treatment, here is this moment of mercy that they offer to Jesus. There, it would have been kind of like a sedative or a, have a numbing effect on Jesus to kind of dull the pain. So even though this is a horrific uh, treatment, the worst kind of execution, maybe in, in human history, even the Romans had mercy on those who would suffer in this way. So they offered him something that will kind of dull the effects of the pain and suffering he's about to endure on the cross. But interestingly, Jesus doesn't accept it. I, the reason for that is he wants to take on the full weight of that suffering. He wants to feel it all as we feel our suffering as well. There's a similar scene in the movie Braveheart where he's offered uh, kind of a, a similar mixture that would, would dull the pain, and he takes it, and then he spits it out when the princess leaves. And for him, it's because he wants to keep his wits about him. He wants to be able to be sharp, and to be, you know, he doesn't want to recant against what he's, he's done. But in that moment, it empowers him to cry out in victory. For Jesus, it's going to allow him to cry out in his weakness, as we'll see next week. And so then we come to the, the climax of this scene where Jesus is crucified. Mark says in verse 24, And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. What's well, interesting that in Mark's gospel, he doesn't provide a lot of detail around crucifixion. He kind of mentions it and kind of passes on right, right to the next point. And the reason for this is that Mark's writing to a primarily Roman audience. They would have been fully aware of crucifixion. They would have known the implications. They would have understood the cruelty and the harshness of that form of death. So Mark has no need to elaborate and explain further what he means by crucifixion. But it was, for the Romans, the final public deterrent to warn people not to rebel against Rome or break the law. It was a threat, not just of death, but painful, excruciating death. It was so, uh, so horrific that Roman citizens weren't actually allowed to be crucified. They were often beheaded instead. It's why later uh, the Apostle Paul, when he's martyred, he is beheaded instead of crucified because he was a Roman citizen. In fact, they weren't even supposed to attend these crucifixions and see it for themselves. And they would have uh, had people crucified because they broke the law or had rebelled against Rome. But we know for Jesus, he's not being crucified because he broke the law. He's actually being crucified in order to fulfill the law on our behalf. And what follows is, then there's this interesting interaction where the, the soldiers who had led him to his death are casting lots to kind of divide up his possessions, his few possessions. Now, in one sense, this exists because it fulfills prophecy. In, in Psalm 22, verses, verse 18, it talks about them dividing his garments. But it's interesting because Jesus was not a wealthy person. He probably didn't have very nice clothing and didn't have very much with him. They'd already stripped him once, so it's very likely that his clothing was, was ripped. It's likely that his clothing had blood on it. So these weren't like prized possessions. But they're essentially fighting over these scraps of clothing in this moment where Jesus is offering to them salvation. They're wanting a, a, a memento, something to remember this moment for, and he is offering himself as the Messiah. And Jesus is, is crucified in this moment between two robbers. And in that, it, it indicates to us that Jesus is, uh, is taking on our, our guilt for our sin. He's identifying himself with people who are guilty of sin. But in doing so, Jesus is charged with claiming to be king of the Jews. That is his 
guilt in the eyes of, of, of Pilate and the Romans. He is guilty of claiming to be king when they believed that Caesar alone was king. And what Jesus is doing is he is connecting himself to a long history in the, in the Jewish, for, with, with the Jewish people. Their desire for a king had been going on for many, many years. We, see in, we first see in 1 Samuel 8, they, they were crying out to Samuel for a king. And they, were, they wanted a king because they wanted to be like the other nations who had kings. And God hears this and says that they have essentially rejected him for desiring a king. That he was their king. He was the one who had ruled over them. And he warns them that a human king will take your children and force them to fight and serve. He'll take the best of your possessions. And when you are in need, he will not defend you. And God says, you have essentially rejected me for requesting a king. But he relents, and he gives them what they ask for. And it sets them on this trajectory that leads to this moment with Jesus right here. The first king that they receive is a man named Saul. And Saul looked like a king. He kind of fit the part. It was he was described as being handsome, a, a handsome young man. That no one among the people was as handsome as he. And that he was shoulders, his, his shoulders upper was taller than any of the people. He was a tall, handsome man. So he represented to them what a king should look like, and so they thought he would be a good king. And for initial part of his reign, he was a good king. He was a conqueror. He conquered many enemies. But he later in his life would not keep the commandments of God. And God later says he regrets, he regretted making Saul king. So they, they, they are given another king, and God tells Samuel to go and find a son of Jesse. And Jesse's got a bunch of sons, and they kind of line them all up. And they all look the part. They're like Saul. They're tall, and they're handsome, they're strong. And Samuel thinks, oh, surely one of these is the chosen king. But God says in, in 1 Samuel 16, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his, of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. So in David, God is saying, my qualifications for king are different than the world's standards. I'm looking at the heart of the person, not the physical appearance or ability. And so David is anointed. We know he you know, famously defeats Goliath. So he conquers because of what God does through him. He honors Saul, who is not very honorable. He eventually returns the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. And then God makes a covenant with David. He says, I will establish the throne of my kingdom forever through you. That when you die, your sons and your lineage will reign forever. It's a pretty powerful promise that God makes with David. But David also fails as well. He commits adultery with Bathsheba, and he has her husband Uriah killed. He, he becomes passive as a king, and his family essentially implodes. But then his son Solomon takes up the mantle, and we know Solomon is known for being a wise man. He prays for wisdom, and God gives him that and, and much more. And David says to him on his deathbed, keep the commandments, keep, the, keep God's commandments so that the throne will continue with you. And he does. He builds the temple for God. He's a wise man. He's a successful king. And then Solomon gets it in his head that it'd be a good idea to marry 700 wives and have 300 concubines. He essentially creates a reality TV show that makes The Bachelor look tame. <laughs> and as you might guess, things do not go very well for Solomon. His son then inherits the throne, and it actually leads to division in the kingdom. Now the once one tribe of Israel, is there, there's a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. And there's a succession of kings. Basically, the second part of 1 Kings all the way through the sec second kings tells the story of uh, one failure after another. The kings who rise to power in both, both the north and south that are mostly, primarily, unfaithful. In fact, the northern kingdom never has a faithful king. The southern kingdom only has a handful. 
This is years and years of Israel's history of poor leadership. What emerges are, are the criteria for a faithful king, which includes worshiping the God of Israel alone, which many of them didn't, ridding Israel of idolatry, which many of them brought in idols, and remaining faithful to God's covenant, which many of them were not. And their failure ultimately leads to both kingdoms being taken into exile. In the north, they're taken to Assyria, in the south, to Babylon. The people of God are fractured and broken and dispersed. But all throughout this long history of failed kings, there's this promise of a king that would come, this chosen one of God, the Messiah. And we read in Isaiah 9, verse 7, Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. There's this language of this eternal kingdom that would include peace and righteousness, which the Israelites had not experienced for some time. With Saul and David and Solomon, they got glimpses of it at times, but it always fell apart. None of those kings was sufficient to hold together this place of peace and righteousness. And then altogether, a whole slew of kings who just completely abandoned that call to peace and righteousness. And so here we have Jesus stepping into this role, claiming to be king of the Jews in the line of David, the Messiah, the chosen one. And the Israelites gather together, and they initially they think, maybe this is the guy, maybe this is him. But in this moment at the cross, all they can see is defeat. This couldn't possibly be our king. Here he hangs on a cross, defeated. And that's their attitude in this last section here in, of chapter 15. We read in verse 29, And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. Well, at least they're consistent. The way they've treated him from the beginning is the way they treat him at the very end. They taunt and test him. But I wonder, do they really want to believe? Do they really want to believe that Jesus is capable of coming down from the cross and saving himself? I think they are actually insecure that he's capable of doing this very thing. And then what will that mean for them if he really does save himself? What they fail to understand is that if Jesus had saved himself, then no one would be saved. Jesus saved himself others by not choosing self-preservation and saving himself. If he had done what they had asked, no one will be saved. There's a, a Hebrew term, uh, the word is anav, which has to do with humility and meekness and weakness. But it's, it's more than that. It's kind of the starting point, but there's more than that. It conveys an individual's devout dependence upon the Lord. This word is actually used to describe Moses in that same scene with Aaron and Miriam that I refer referenced earlier. Moses is described as having a nav, this humility and meekness and weakness, but more so a devout dependence upon the Lord. It also describes someone who prefers to bear, in, uh, to bear injuries rather than return them. And Jesus being the better Moses, that's what he is embodying here. He is bearing these injuries for our sake. He is suffering in our place. He is sacrificing himself so that we can be saved. This is what Paul describes in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6, six through 11. Though he, Jesus, was in the form of God, 
did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What the, the Jewish leaders and the Romans wanted to do was make Jesus' name insignificant, quickly and easily forgotten. They hoped by killing him that this would all just fade away. But God knew that in killing him, it was what would make his name great. That we would bow and worship to him when just the mere mention of his name was, re was referenced. So how do we respond to this Jesus who sacrificed himself on our behalf, who took on not only the guilt for our sin, but the shame that we experience. The beliefs we have about our unworthiness, our difference, our lack of belonging. Well, there's, there's several, several different ways we can respond, which we see in this scene here. We can be like the Sanhedrin, actively opposing Jesus. There are some of us here, our hearts are hard toward Jesus. We reject his lordship. We don't want to honor and worship him as king. We want to oppose him because we, we know that if he really is king, that's going to have some great implications for our lives. Some of us here are more like the Roman soldiers. Maybe we're not mocking and shaming Jesus, but we're, we're going through the motions of, of paying homage to him, of honoring him. We don't really mean, it's not sincere, we're just showing up and looking like we genuinely believe he's the king. We know that one of those Roman soldiers was converted in this moment. He saw Jesus die on the cross, and he acknowledged that, that Jesus truly was the Son of God. For some of you here, that might be your experience today, or as you come and hear of who this Jesus is, You've considered, who is this man who would give his life for others? And you, like the centurion, would acknowledge that he is the Son of God. He is God's chosen Messiah. Some of us are like Simon of Serene. We're swept up into the action of God's work of salvation. We get to see front row, uh, we get a front row seat to see his work of grace. And we want to be close to him. We want to receive his mercy. Well, this, this passage ends with the acknowledgement that one of the, or sorry, that both of the robbers that were crucified to him were also reviling Jesus. They were mocking him. They were contributing to the insults. But we learn in Luke's gospel that one of those robbers also is converted. He's seeing Jesus respond to this treatment, and he, too, is asking this question, who is this man? And he comes to faith in the final moment of death. And he pleads with Jesus not to forget him, and Jesus promises that he will be with him in paradise following his death. There's this, this confession at the end of his life. So it, what it says to us is it's never too late even though we might be wrestling and fighting and resisting, even though we might have lived a life in, in complete contrast to what Jesus has called us to, it is never too late for us to bend our knee and honor him as Lord. And we have that opportunity today. There's a, a story that uh, in the Roman Empire around 250 AD, the emperor uh, Decius issued an edict ordering everyone in the Roman Empire to perform a sacrifice. They had to, to burn incense to the Roman gods and the well-being of the emperor. They had to essentially show their allegiance to the pagan religion and to the emperor. This, he took this so seriously that they had to uh, offer the sacrifice in front of a Roman magistrate 
and receive a signed and witness certificate issued to that effect. So everyone was required to do this and have proof and testimony that they had completed this act. It was the first time that Christians had faced legislation forcing them to choose between their religious beliefs and death. That was the penalty for refusal, and there were many Christians who were persecuted for refusing to offer this sacrifice to the Roman gods and the emperor. See, what, the, what Emperor Decius understood is that allegiance of the people is important. And what we, what we do as we participate in communion each week is we're not offering a sacrifice to Jesus. We're actually remembering the sacrifice that he made on our behalf. But in doing so, we are showing our allegiance to him as our king. We are honoring him as he told us to. We are remembering him. We are remembering the sacrifice that he made which allowed him to become king and welcome us into his kingdom. So we're going to pray, and then I want to invite you to come forward and participate in communion, testifying to your faithfulness to Jesus, but also celebrating his faithfulness to us. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for sending your own son for us that you chose him as king, that you knew that we needed a king to rule and reign over us, that we are in need of protection, of guidance, but more, more so, we are in need of mercy. We are in need of saving. And so you've sent your son to save. And that is good news for us as your people. Good news that there is a king, his name is Jesus, he rules and reigns, and he is bringing his kingdom to earth as it is in heaven. Give us hope for that day and help us to be faithful to you, our good king. Help us to honor you, to praise you, to worship you now. Help us to celebrate the gift of grace that you have given us, to make much of your name. We thank you. We ask you to be with us now by your spirit. In your name, amen.